Each week, American History TV's Real America brings you archival films that provide context for today's public affairs issues. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the opening of the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum on July 1st, 1976. Leading up to the July 1st anniversary celebration, Real America will be showing a series of NASA films. Up next, Science Reporter, Food for Space Travelers. When John Glenn got hungry during his three-orbit flight in 1962, he simply opened the visor on his helmet and popped a high-energy tablet into his mouth. This pill, a few sips of water, and an occasional squeezing of baby food from a toothpaste container were more than Glenn actually needed for the four and a half hours he was in orbit. The purpose of the meal was to find out whether man could even eat in a weightless condition. Mealtime aboard those early Mercury flights was hardly more than a light snack. Yet even at that, it was considerably more sophisticated than the brown paper bag and thermos diet common to the earliest in-flight feeding during World War II. Since 1961, food scientists have been hard at work studying and developing space foods and measuring their effects upon man. The problems, even for short flights, have been enormous. Yet as we continue to launch longer and longer missions into space, entirely new considerations must be met and dealt with in planning and providing food for space travelers. How space food scientists are doing this is our story today on Science Reporter. Here we see a series of stressors as one might expect during a space flight. First, the effect of g-forces as you would get on liftoff or on re-entry as done by centrifugation. This is the acceleration and deceleration during the flight. Exactly. Here is a an impact test, or oh. <laughs> as you would get on a hard landing, for mm -hmm. instance. Here we see vibration. This occurs, especially on liftoff, in combination with the acceleration. And it may vary considerably with the type of booster. Wouldn't be as violent as that, I hope. No, here at this level, we're seeing the establishment of tolerance limits. Here we see a the effect of noise combined with a disorientation. The noise of the rocket motor? Yes, and also just the noise of friction as mm -hmm. the, uh, for instance, escape tower would function. Here is a uh, study of altered atmosphere. Now this is a, this is long-term type stressor. This will always be present. 100% oxygen at 5 PSI, for example. Mm -hmm. Or even mixtures of gases that we're now studying. Now this is an example of uh, disorientation as one gets with tumbling, as you probably well remember in GT5, especially when the power is off, the spacecraft tends to tumble. Oh, I see. And you're likely to get dizzy, I suppose, if you kept it up. Well, they probably don't notice dizziness, but uh, mm -hmm. you may be altering the vestibular apparatus, especially when you combine it with weightlessness. And this is the most uh, critical, I think, and, and uh, the least known factor of the spaceflight uh, stressors certainly the one of continued duration. I could see how some of those stresses might make you lose your appetite for a few hours, but do they really affect your need for food? Well, the short duration stresses are probably do affect your appetite momentarily, but I don't believe they necessarily would affect your total nutrient requirement over any extended period of time. However, certainly those long duration stresses, uh, the altered atmosphere, the weightlessness, and the radiation, which we didn't mention, the continued exposure to radiation or bursts of radiation, might singularly or in combination substantially alter nutrient requirements. 